next uh, speaker is Bonnie Norman, um, and she's going to be talking about uh, laser track. And laser track, uh, she was during that she was implementing uh, this graphics software for a CD-ROM-based portable flight system, flight planning system for the aviation industry. Uh, she created and implemented compression algorithm, al algorithms to reduce in-flight graphical transmittal time of weather charts from 10 minutes all the way down to 20 seconds. That's pretty radical. Uh, she optimized flight planning capabilities, reducing time from 20 minutes to about less than a minute, and designing new features to assist pilots, including airport location, optimized flight planning, overlay of flight path of weather. Um, so, without further ado, welcome, Bonnie. Thank you, Jeff. So, um, I'm actually, you know, I talked to the two other engineers I worked with on this um, when you and I first started talking, and the three of us are thrilled that this is not getting lost um, to history. So, you know, we, we put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into this. So, let me tell you a little bit about me, and then about the product and some of the crazy stuff we did back then. So the laser track, it was known as the FP100. Um, and to the best of our knowledge, we started in 1984. Um, and I'll talk about our demise around 1989 when we get there. So um, just a little bit about me. Um, just got my resume, but this is probably the stuff that's most of interest. Um, computer science at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, I taught um, intro to computer science for engineers using Pascal, and this was in the early 80s. Um, database theory for the grad students, Fortran 77 and BASIC. Um, laser track was my first industry job, and um, I hadn't planned on going there permanently, but you know, industry over university was much better pay. Um, in my career, I moved up into engineering management, uh, running uh, multidisciplinary projects for highly complex software driven um, in mostly regulated industries, both medical device and aeronautics. In medical device, I moved over into quality and regulatory. May seem like a step down to some people from um, engineering, but here's the reality for that. You know, there's so many times in your career you think that if I were in charge, I would be doing this differently, whatever this may be. And quality and regulatory allowed me to drive changes to how we develop products, how we, how engineering worked, what type of documentation we did and didn't have to do. Um, you know, it just, it, it was a lot more, interesting than just engineering management because it, it covered everything from the moment you think of a new product to post-market activities to marketing etc um the two biggest employers i worked for battelle memorial institute where i headed up design assurance some of you may or may not be familiar with battelle out of columbus ohio um, at the time we were running three national labs for the government, um, Pacific Northwest was the one I primarily worked with, and we did some really cool projects, like a portable ultrasound for the Army um, that the guys took up on top of, of in Nepal, up on, on top of Everest, uh, so that just for testing purposes, I think it was their excuse, um, but doctors at Walter Reed could literally examine a patient in the field with the portable ultra with the field medic um, and the soldier right there and the doctors at Walter Reed doing an exam remotely and then Intel Corporation where I was responsible for getting our first medical device uh, through food and drug clearance and onto the market and then areas that I still have a lot of interest in and I do teaching in it's risk management is applied to product development, testing strategies, quality system as a business practice. So that's a little bit about me and I'm, I'm glad to answer any questions on it, but that's it. So this is the LaserTrack FP100. 
And what you see here besides the very clearly 1980 graphics for this was um, a box that had a CD-ROM drive in it. It was the Sony CD-ROM drive. Had a keyboard that fit on the top. Um, and you can see we had two lines there of screen. <laughs> and that was what we used. And then I had a thermal printer inside. And in 1985, the revolutionary to, to have this where we could print on demand. I'll give you a little bit of information about the products. So, I'm not sure why that came up there. So it's a flight planning system. So we had two two databases on the CD-ROM. It we had all of the Jeppesen charts, and and I'll explain what Jep charts are here in a second. But um, for for the U.S. and that allowed pilots to print a customized flight plan on demand. Um, even, even if they changed their route in flight, they were able to update. And before this, what pilots had available, there was no electronic form of these. We scanned them all in. Um, Jefferson provided us with the paper copies every, and we scanned them all, all in. And it, prior to this, pilots would receive a packet of paper from Jefferson Sanderson every month with their updated charts, they would take out their jet books um, that fit in a case that was exactly the same size as the laser track case. And they would pull out the outdated charts and update with their new charts. And then if they were planning a flight plan, they would have to go through their chart books and pull the charts they needed for the specific flight they were taking that day. So it was very tedious and allowed them to do is enter in their destination, any specific waypoints they wanted along the way, and they would get all the information, the runway information, navigation information that they needed. And so it would just print out a packet for them on demand. And that was a pretty big deal for pilots. And we had some pretty cool pilots too, I have to say. So Christopher Reeve of Superman fame became a friend of mine during that time. He was a pilot at that point. Um, Grateful Dead, um, their pilot, Steve Kahn, was one of our customers, so we spent a lot of time on the phone talking about the dead over the years. Um, we just had some fun customers in there. The case size, it was important that we had to have this exactly the same size as the, as the um, charts case, because that was the only room in the cockpit for the product. It, it, there is no spare room in a cockpit. So that was the one requirement that was a hard requirement that we could not change. We couldn't make it bigger. Um, we couldn't make it way more. It just, it needed to fit within the parameters of the existing case that they used. And this is just an example of the jet chart here. So just one of thousands. The other thing that was important too, was that Jeppesen and LaserTrack, we sold GeoBay subscription. You could subscribe to the entire United States. You could subscribe to just the Western region. Um, there were a variety of different subscriptions available. The advantage of the system was if you changed your paper-based subscription, you had to wait for the additional charts to show up in the mail. With our system, we could unlock by giving them a code uh, once they updated their subscription information and they would have immediate access to a larger number of charts on demand. Next slide. All right. Monthly CD. So as I was mentioning, it was a geo-based subscription, um, password protected, obviously. Each CD had three software images along with the updated JEP charts and waypoint data. So the software images, we had the current image that when you logged on as a customer, that was the image that was going to run. It might have bug fixes, it may have some new features, but that was the image. Then we had the previous month's image, just in case we missed something in our data, we could back people up to an earlier version of software. 
And then, of course, we had the beta image for with stuff that we wanted to test out in the field. And we had a few customers that were um, approved for testing under the beta and the password to get to that. So uh, remember, this was the 80s. And it was usually about a 30-hour process to link all the software libraries just to build the image. It was, it was it, the whole, we shut down during that time. And because there was, we couldn't use computing power for anything else other than, other than building the image. Once we tested the image, um, one of the other engineers, Steve, usually flew to Terre Haute to the Sony plant um, with the tapes in his carry-on. And, and took them there in person. Um, Terre Haute was kind of interesting. Sony did all the music CDs. So it was August, I think, 1987, August 31st, when Michael Jackson's Thriller came out. And they were doing tens of thousands of those CDs. And somehow we had to get our 200 um, into, their, into their manufacturing queue, which we did. I learned early on that if we ordered CDs and an odd ordering exactly 200, I'd order 210 because they would fill the empty space in. So there were 100 in a box. And if I ordered 210, they had to fill, there was room for 90 more, and they would just grab music CDs off the Sony line to fill the box up for shipping purposes. So we, we got a lot of good music that way. Um, just because that's how Sony filled the box. And we believed at the time, and I've yet to find data to show this isn't true, um, we believed we were the first commercially available data CD on the market. And that was in 1985 when it was publicly available. Next slide, Jeff. All right. Got it. Okay, so specifications for the product. Um, like I said, it had to be exactly the same size as a JEP case. Um, it weighed 20 pounds. We had two lines on the screen and 40 characters per line. So our user interface was, was kind of crude. Um, we had a thermal printer inside the box that was 240 dots per inch. We had a high speed modem at, well, you can see the baud right there. Um, our processor was Motorola 68020 is what we finally went to market with. Did not have a whole lot of memory and memory errors were, well, we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, CD and, and remember for most of us, myself included, this was the first time we had seen CD-ROMs and stunning how much information we could fit on one. And then the languages we use was mostly C with some assembly code. Next slide. All right, got it. Okay, languages used um, about 80% C, about 20% assembly code. Uh, the JEP charts, we compress, we image them and compress them. The paper versions were supplied by Jefferson Sanderson, who supplied the majority of the charts to the aviation industry. And then we used a B tree format. We used to navigate object oriented database, uploading all the navigation points from government databases. Okay, next slide. All right, got it. So, startup life. I'm going to just tell a little bit. Hold on, there we go. So we had two VAX 11780s. We paid about $1 million each for those. They were severely, we, they did not have the computing power we needed, which is why there would be 30 hours for building an image. Or if I was just compiling some code, I might ask Stephen Howard to stop doing whatever they're doing um, so we could let things compile and we'd just go for a walk out in the parking lot. Um, we were in Boulder, Colorado. I should have mentioned that. Um, we paid for state of the art. The Sony CD drive was about $600 wholesale, um, which is kind of hard to believe today, but, but that is, that's what we paid. Um, there were three software engineers, a hardware engineer, and way too many people in upper management. Um, we had far more people in management watching what we were doing 
than um, engineering. No desk at first. I, I remember the first few months just sitting on the floor with, with my monitor in front of me. I learned C, so remember I said I had, I had been teaching um, at the university, Fortran, BASIC. I was familiar with everything there, but I had not written in C before, and so I just kept a manual open on my lap, and I would write code, and I would get error messages, and I would figure out what I did wrong. Um, and this was C, not C++. There was no object-oriented um, coding. It was all top-down design at that point. We were, we were supplied libraries, um, like math libraries, et cetera. I couldn't figure out one day why my code wouldn't run. I kept getting the same errors. And we sat down, we opened up the debugger, and we walked line by line through the code and we found in the math libraries that were supplied to us they had addition problems and that was what was causing our code to fail and so we learned a big lesson that day of not not trusting the libraries that were supplied to operating system memory errors um, I was telling Jeff this story early on so we had a lot of memory errors that would show up, and there wasn't that much memory. Um, it was good for planning because at the end of flight planning, after running one or two flight plans, they'd shut the unit off to save power, which reset everything. But at a show, um, if I were demonstrating the product um, at an aviation conference, I could see when it was starting to lock up. So I had a favorite trick which was I would make sure the power cord was just plugged into the device. And if I saw it was hanging up, I'd kind of hit it with my hip and say, oh, I unplugged it by mistake, hold on, and, <laughs> and would reset, the, reset everything that way. Eventually, we went to a um, scheme where we used, I, I like the name of Smart Alec, um, where we could allocate memory just using um, a just using an identifier we could we could release by category so we could do a, a smart, smart alloc release all we could just vary of the product but we could clear memory errors even though we didn't know where they might all be coming from a lot of rogue coding going on. So one that we were particularly proud of, and, and I didn't do this one, I'm going to give Howard full credit, but we all cheered when it worked, is we had a bug on the product out in the field, and we had a patch for the bug, but the only way it could be applied was while the software was running. And we literally were able, over, over the modem, to deliver the patch and the patch applied itself to the running code and it worked it fixed the problem and we're still kind of amazed over that today because remember this is 85 right around B tree navigation um, Jeff mentioned in the the um, compression that some stuff up this one I was I'll take full credit for and I first will We'll tell you my motivation. So to build a flight plan took anywhere from a minute and a half up to 20 minutes. And, you know, 20 minutes was still faster than a pilot would do it, but not optimal. Um, and I had some, the person who was in charge of the B tree, I won't give his name in case any of you know, but he, um, he and I did not get along, and I thought about the bee tree a lot, and I was probably inspired by my dislike for this person, and I realized that instead of navigating the bee tree as I should, that it was possible at a node to just go find the address and go straight to the information instead of navigating the bee tree. And I likened it to opening up somebody's chest and just reaching straight in to it. So my, my, it, it changed the time from up to 20 minutes to 10 seconds to build the flight plan. Um, 
but the amount of commenting I did, I probably had three pages explaining what I did for about, you know, a hundred lines of code. Um, but it was definitely rogue coding at that point. And hold up. Just scroll down here. Um, next slide. Port to the new OS. Got it. Motorola C yep, 820. So we were given we were given one week, three engineers, for tens of thousands of lines of code to port to the, the entire OS, any code mod modifications, everything, getting the hardware running right, we were given one week. And I have the schedule someplace. Steve and I were talking last week about it, but it literally said, at 2 o'clock, Bonnie will finish this. At 2.30, we'll finish this. It was line by line. And it was impossible it took us two whole weeks to do it and we slept there we were there 24 hours a day except for one little excursion which i'll tell you about but we were there around the clock and and, and getting this work done uh, marketing called us in when we missed the one week deadline marketing called the three of us into the conference room and he showed a picture of the new car he wanted to buy. And the way he inspired us was by telling us that, that people, hard work doesn't, doesn't count, uh, results do. And this was a man who was showing up at 10 a.m. in the morning and going home at 5 p.m. And we were there seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So that night, and we could look up the date to come up exactly when this, this was, but um, a fish called Wanda, was in the theaters and Steve Howard and I all came up with different excuses. We had to leave that night and we were at the theater to watch a movie, hunkered down in our seats, afraid that somebody was going, um, not at the office working on porting the code, but at a movie. But we were, we were pretty annoyed at that, part, at that point by marketing. So yeah, we got it done in two weeks and it should have been a multi-month job, but we got it done. Uh, next slide. All right, got it. This one I was particularly proud of. Some of you may remember um, when there were phones in the back of the seat in front of you when you were flying. They were they were produced by Global Wolfsburg, and they allowed you to make phone calls in flight. It also allowed us allowed us to send data up in flight. Um, not fast. We didn't have a lot of bandwidth to do that. So what, and, and well, there's a whole bunch of parts to this. So one, you know, we had to, we had to on top of the building um, to pick up data coming in from weather stations across the U.S. And I will tell you at that point in time, and things may be different now, but weather stations across the U.S. not only use their own particular way to show that it was the end of the data stream, Everybody was different, but sometimes they just changed on the fly. They would decide this month they're going to use three hashtags to show that the data is done. Next month, it might be a series of nines with a hashtag at the end. We couldn't count on them being consistent. So it's a particular point of pride that that code ran probably a year and a half without modification at taking in the data from the different weather to come up with just about every variable they could possibly throw our way. Um, the compression scheme, obviously we didn't have enough bandwidth to send a map up to flight. So what I had done is if you think of a map as having a grid pattern on it, for every single one of those squares, what are all the possible, possible mapping for that small grid? And which, which is a very easily solvable problem because what we did then was put the grid elements, all the different grid, grid elements, we had them contained already on the CD. So when I sent up, sent up the map, I was actually sending up directions to the FP100 on how to using the data that was coming up. So it would access the elements on the CD and assemble a map using those. And then we'd be able to overlay that on a pilot's route. 
this was helpful because if they're flying, if they're in route and they're able to see that their route's going right through the middle of a thunderstorm, um, they can reroute in flight. They could use their FP100 to print a new flight plan around the, the weather. So last slide, and then we can just talk right. questions. What happened to laser track, right? I mean, we had a great product. So right here, I mean, funding, this, this was the number one reason. Um, you know, at this point in time, what you see, Jeppesen had, you can get all their charts online now. Laser track would have been out of business anyway at this point. Jeppesen would have taken over. Uh, but we, you know, over all the years, there were so many times we were close to going out of business because of lack of funding. And we somehow squeaked through every time. And then finally, Delta had a huge investment they were putting into us. And it was the first time we did not have to worry about funding and we had a breather coming up. And the next day we were out of business because Delta pulled their funding at the last second because there were a number of gates opening up at Chicago Midway and they decided to put the funding there. And they bought over at Chicago Midway. And we literally went from finally breathing again and coming into work happy to the CEO coming by our desk and saying, pack up and go home, we're out of business. And that was the end. That was how we ended there. Um, Right now, I'm. I think I have a FP100 track down for you, Jeff. I have. I have the brochures. I have some CD-ROMs. I have the code anymore. Um, a lot got lost there, but it's old now. So that was the end of the company. After all those years of blood, sweat, and tears of living at the office, of of building something that hadn't been done before, of of coming up with new ways to compress data that hadn't been done before and getting out a product like this that that we all felt you know it was it was our baby um it was our baby so that's pretty much the laser track product can i all answer right. questions about that? all right let me make you bigger hold on turn off the slideshow all right so, um, do we have any questions from the audience out there? Who has the questions in, on YouTube? You can also post your comments in the question area. Anybody have any questions? So they said they had local hard drive storage. Did it have local hard drive? No, none at all. None at all. It was just memory? It was just memory? Everything was... Um, all the charts, the B-tree, everything were contained on the CD-ROM. And so when you got your new disk in the mail, um, you would load it in to the machine. And, okay, there was, there was a non-volatile memory. So it would load that up and replace it. So, yes, I misspoke when I said no on it, that it was all on the CD. It... It, all the code was on the CD, all the charts and everything. The code would upload to the FP100, but all the data it accessed was on CD-ROM. Does that answer your question? Good. Any other questions? Yes. So when you were burning the CD, did you have to fill it up with extra space? No. No, no. No, we did not. Um, yeah, I don't remember that ever coming up even as an issue. We just were glad not to run out of space. It was kind of amazing to us at the time. Um, but no, we we did not have to fill the CD. Any other questions in audience? Did the chart company take your scans and sell them? No, but what they did do, and I didn't mention this, it, it just would have, it wasn't the reason for our demise, is Jefferson at one 
point, we could tell they were starting to think of doing a similar product for themselves because they started getting much more difficult to deal with in terms of, of, of supplying charts to us. Um, there was a government, so their data all came from government databases. So one of the things Steve in particular was doing was looking at how to take the government data and use it so we could produce our own charts if Jefferson pulled our licensing. They didn't, but we certainly thought they were going to. How many do you think shipped? Um, I'm going to say about 300. <laughs> I, I'd like to say thousands, but no, about 300. I mean, it, it was pretty cutting edge at the time. The, the good news is pilots were usually and still are ready to look at technology. Um, but, you know, it was something different and it, it was an uphill battle. Um, our head of marketing, the one who tried to inspire us by telling us our hard work didn't matter, um, was a pilot also. And, and actually, a funny story, um, we had we had an outside company doing the user interface for us, and, and Bob, our marketing guy, the pilot, didn't like the UI. And um, I was asked to try to get this guy who was doing the UI, get him on board. And so I went and talked to him and I, I said, Chris, Bob doesn't understand the UI. And he goes, well, that's because Bob doesn't, doesn't know much about user interfaces. And I said, well, Bob's a pilot. If he can't use the UI, there's a problem. And, and Chris at the time told me that um, Bob hadn't taken user interface classes, so therefore his opinion didn't matter. We, uh, we got somebody else to do the UI after that or two page, a two line, 40 character UI. One from YouTube. Did you have, also have unroute charts on the CD or only approach plates? If oh no, we had, we had to, everything. If it's available from Jefferson. Um, so you got the approach plates, you got, you got uh, the flight plan itself showed your recommended waypoints um you got that data you got the charts for that and then the overall flight plan showing the different waypoints um so it says you know if you did have the enroute charts did they print the enroute charts as they were flying no 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 usually the pilot would um enter all the information for their flight plan up front and print the package. Um, and so they'd have a little, I'm trying to see my screen here. Yeah, I can see um, Just a little stack of folded charts that just opened up as they went. Okay, any other questions from the in-person audience? Uh, go The compression technology, after it was done, did, it, did that compression technology live on in, in any form? Not that I'm aware of. Um, and, you know, I'll, I give credit to Stephen Howard for a lot, but that compression uh, for the weather data in particular of doing a grid and an overlay and uplay, I wrote that and I, I certainly never used it any place else. Um, you know... I don't. I, I am unaware of it ever being used again. So the, but it worked for us for a limited bandwidth. So would you say that the um, the coding for the compression was the hardest part of the whole system on coding? Would you say that was the hardest part? No, no. Um, I'd say the flight planning and and doing the uh, navigating the B tree and creating a flight plan. Um, was probably the most uh, complex work. The, the weather data, once we figured out how to deal with the weather stations and, and their various ways of reporting data, and once, once settled on a compression algorithm, it was pretty straightforward code. Um, but the flight planning itself was much more complex 
in terms of lines of code and and complexity of code. So it sounded like you were saying that uh, you were sort of learning C programming as you went along. Um, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell. I mean, I didn't tell them I knew how to program and see, but, but yeah, that was, I mean, you know, within a month I, I was fully competent coding and C, but yeah, I just had the, had a manual open on my lap and go, oh, okay, that's the error and, and go fix it in the code. So what um, kind of references? You know, really, I've been, I've been teaching Pascal, right? So yeah. um, I always looked at, you know, at C at that time and Pascal were so similar. I always likened it to if you were driving a car, Pascal had had guardrails up, it wouldn't let you go off the road. Um, whereas C just figured if you wanted to go off the road, that's what you were planning on doing. <laughs> so the languages are pretty similar. Um, just had a few more safeguards with Pascal, though I did find ways to go off the road with Pascal too. Um, so did, what kind of references did you use to, tr to learn the language, Is particular books or, or particular people? How did you, uh, what did you do to sort of figure it out? Well, uh, you know, I, so I had been teaching Pascal, right? And, and I was also been teaching with other languages. So computing languages were not... Um, foreign to me, obviously. And it was still all top-down design. There was no object-oriented um, programming at that point in time. So the, you know, program design, everything was exactly the same. The only thing that was different was some of the specifics of, you know, you still had, you know, if then you still had all the same structures, just slightly different um, characters being used. And I just, I had a C manual on, you know, right there in front of me. So if something didn't work when I coded it, I just went back and looked it up and, and found what the right symbols were that I should have used or, or no, I didn't close that comment off correctly or, you know, whatever, whatever the reason might be. I mean, okay, so, you know, when Bax VMS returned the too many errors to list um, <laughs> response, <laughs> I, I'd start laughing. But, yeah, and plus I had two other engineers there who I had been at school with, right, and so who did know C well, so they'd poke me in the side and, and give me a heads up on, on what I'd left out. Do you remember the name of the book? It was like Kernig and Ritter, or NCC. You know, it might have been. It was like 85. I just don't remember. Okay, you know, that's all right. I, I'm just curious. Yeah. A lot yeah. of people are like... I mean, I remember what my Pascal book looked like, um, but no, I don't remember on the C. Yeah, I, I, I started Pascal when I started uh, Drexel. In was it the black and yellow book? No, it was... Uh, I believe it was a white book. I don't know what the color of lettering yeah. was. Um, yeah. I'd have to oh, remember. during this time too, just. <laughs> I'd have to look it up. I don't remember which one it was. I probably still have it. I saved all my books for some reason. Yeah, uh, we got a little drunk one night and decided to send Donald Knuth a birthday card. <laughs> because we figured it must be his birthday. Oh. We had to have a reason. Did you want to talk anything about some any of those, those famous people? Or I mean, we still have a little time left. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So uh, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So Don Knuth, those of you familiar with sorting his his series of three books on computer science, is that familiar to people in this audience? The Art of Computer Programming is that the one? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Volume three is my favorite sorting and searching algorithms. That's, that's my favorite topic actually to talk about. Um, so we had maybe had a few too many drinks at university to drink um, one after it was actually afternoon after a couple of friends um, successfully defended their postdoc. And we decided to, um, we had to have a reason to celebrate. So we, we, created a birthday card for Donald Knuth and we sent it to him and we actually got a letter back from him um, 
saying it wasn't his birthday, but it was his dog Pepper's birthday, and <laughs> and it started some good exchanges back and forth with Don. Um, another name that probably is familiar to many of you, especially if you um, are doing any sysadmin, any work in the sysadmin place, Evie Nemeth, um, who wrote the sysadmin Bible. Um, Evie was, was a good friend of mine and babysitter for my son. Um, when I first, when I first went to the University of Colorado at Boulder, I was a single parent and, um, both the grad students and professors like Evie took me under their wing, um, probably cause I was closer to them in age than I was to incoming freshmen. And, uh, <laughs> Evie, I, is, is Evie's name familiar to this audience? Is it Evie, I, I don't anybody know that, Evie? But... No. <laughs> no, no, okay. Nobody. But look up Evie at some point. Yeah, she was a character. And, and yeah, those, those are probably the two biggest names. I mean, there were people like Ange Aaronfoyt and, and other people doing some work in AI at the time. John um, Atanasoff, the fourth. Oh, John Atanasoff. Well, yeah, okay. Thank you for reminding me. Um, I, the company I went to after LaserTrack was then called RELA, um, which became Colorado MedTech, and they're also out of business now, too. But John Atanasoff's son, John Atanasoff IV, was our CEO. Um, John Atanasoff is actually credited with building the first computer in Iowa. Um, do you know who the other people are with John on that? Um, I don't. Oh. Not off the top. Yeah. Of my head. Well, Smithsonian. The Smithsonian has credited him for it. And if you are at the Computer Museum in Mountain View, there's a um, display on John Atanasoff and his early computing work. But his son, John V. Atanasoff the Fourth, was our CEO and and spent a lot of time telling us stories about his dad in the early days of the industry. Um, just you know the rooms that as a little kid the rooms mm. full of computing equipment from floor to ceiling um that now you know my smartphone probably does more than those rooms did at that point in time i have a question from i have a question from uh, youtube how many segment faults did you get a week oh i don't know um yeah, I don't, that doesn't even, doesn't even register with me. Our biggest thing, we're just tracking down memory errors. And uh, that was pretty much our biggest issue at any point in time with that product. Because it ate up a lot when it was running. All right, any last questions from the audience? Yes. All right, you ported it to the 68020. What did you use before that? That's a really good question. I've been bugging Stephen Howard to see if they remember. I don't, I, I just don't remember. That has been erased in my memory completely. I think it was the 68,000, but none of us can swear to that. <laughs> if I ever find the old schedule, I'll know. But um, I don't know off the top of my head. All right, any more questions, audience? Nothing from YouTube. All right. Well, I think that's uh, it for today. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, you're right. This yeah. is like a little bit of piece of history that's like really interesting, fascinating. Um, uh, d you know, definitely interested to our, our, our type of crowd. Um, um, so I appreciate you coming and giving a talk here. And uh, and I will get you. I will get you an FP100 before August. I'm. I've been working on tracking that down. Plus all the brochures that are framed. I have those for you. Oh yeah, that'd be awesome. We can definitely display it here, um, either in our museum or in one of the in in museums at InfoAge, because you know this is uh, formerly Camp Forever. Evans, you know, military base, and so is right in line with what they do here. Um, you know, down the road we have a. A piece of the Apollo guidance computer, so there's definitely lots of interesting stuff here. We could be able to add to it. Great, yeah, because we would, uh, all of us that have been involved with laser track in the past, would dearly love not to see this be forgotten. So um, that'd be fantastic. Thank you, Jeff. 
All right. Well, thank you very much. Everyone give her a big hand. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. Thanks.